I have a truly remarkable guest joining us. Born in Sweden in 1962, Cecilia Eckroff, now known as Inea, has embarked on an extraordinary journey that seamlessly weaves together her passion for art, sports, corporate leadership, and spirituality. And from the age of five, Inea devoted herself to the artistic path, utilizing her art as a tool for a lifelong investigation into an authentic life beyond societal norms. Beginning her career as a tennis coach at 14, she honed her understanding of people and their motivations through training individuals of all ages and levels of competition. In her 30-year coaching career, she not only excelled in sports, but also showcased her love and talent for art and exhibitions across Scandinavia and beyond. Transitioning into the corporate world, Inea became a consultant, board member, and creator of educational programs, specializing in integrating creativity and entrepreneurship to eliminate silos between different fields of excellence. She's even taken on the role of owner and operator of a refugee camp, facing the harsh realities of trauma, war, and loss. In the last eight years, Inea delved into the healing arts, becoming a sound healer, energy healer, and delving into shamanic studies. As the founder of Oak Root Spiritual Academy, she brings together her diverse life's work under one roof, aiming to connect seekers to their divine duality and contribute to the earth and its people's ascension. So join us today for a captivating conversation as Inea shares insights from her <laughs> unique journey. Inea, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, your mm. from our previous conversations mm. when we spoke began at the tender age of five, when a simple family moment reveals a profound truth about yeah. your identity as an artist, and the the impact of that realization really set the stage for yeah. a lifetime. Yeah, because it wasn't a nice, it was really a confronting um, place where I was drawing and having a very much fun. And my, my brother was also doing it and he, he was really so good, three years older and so good. And I was just playing, but I, I really loved it. And then my mother said, oh, you are so good, both of you, you could be artists. And then my father said, yeah. Oh, not Cecilia, but Stefan, maybe. So what, and, what, what was that pivot in That moment, enabled? it was like my heart was taken out of me and I didn't exist. So I just know that if I'm not an artist, I will not exist. How did it shape your understanding of yourself as an artist? I had both the feeling of not being good enough and that if I'm not existing. So I was just going deep into my love of painting and doing it uh, and didn't think so much about being good in it, but I, uh, because I just understood my love for it so deeply at that moment. Then of course, as everyone who practices a lot and, and loves something, it goes fine. Yeah. <laughs> and also in your teens, you embarked on a dual life, one filled with the magic of artist, artistic mm -hmm. mastery and the other marred by personal struggles. And despite yeah. facing all that adversity, you found strength through powerful guidance and eventually made a, this courageous decision to start anew. How did the juxtaposition of your magical mastery and personal struggles influence your perspective on, on life? And what role did guidance play during those challenging times? Yeah, it was when I was 30 and I really was uh, depressed. My family was in such a bad mess, making us, everyone suffer in the family. And I tried to do everything. As a 10 years old, I started to clean and uh, make the dishes, everything in the home to make them quiet. And just got, uh, just got worse and worse. And uh, in the school, there was so much mobbing. And I, it was like the world was too dense. It was like I have no place in the world. So actually at that time, 
I was going outside and not being with people at all. I was like hiding from people. But at the time, I got so very sick so that I uh, was taken to a hospital for three weeks, couldn't breathe, and I had, had really big issues with my physical. And uh, at that place, there was a therapist uh, made me uh, paint on pearls and gave me a book about Pollyanna. <laughs> and that really was a shift. First her loving presence and my creativity that was reborn. And the Pollyanna game, what I remember is one special occasion when she had a very bad stepmother who gave her some cricket to walk on on her birthday. And she she just got so happy that, oh, now I see I don't need crickets. Cricket. That's fantastic. So she had this view of life after a year or something. She broke her leg and then she was so happy that she had this cricket. <laughs> so I just Sorry, start what, what playing is... that game. The one that you go with, I don't know, maybe I have the wrong word because I'm Swedish. Maybe she had this, that, that you have when you can't walk without them. This, oh, uh, crutches. Crutches, yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. Sorry. That's all right. So I, I, anyway, I applied this game because I was always a playing girl. I like to play. So I start to play everything that was a struggle to see that, oh, that's very good. I don't have to join it that way. And I start to play that game and it's a sense of humor put me away from the depression. Mm. And the creativity in the mind, how to shift my awareness of things and starting to feel what's not mine. It seems that creativity became your tool for survival and you found guidance, yeah. even in the face of adversity. Can you elaborate on how creativity and planetary sounds, and especially your connection with your daughter, played crucial roles during those years of minimal resources and challenges? Okay, let's look yeah, later. Actually, it was exactly 13 years more later. <laughs> uh, I was already a tennis coach. I had a uh, good fortune with my art and everything. And I traveled with the world to understand where I came from because I didn't feel that I came from the society or family that I was in. And that woman that I traveled with, my best friend since I was eight years, that I was really built up my life together with, she turned after when we were 26, she turned first very deep depressed and then schizophrenic. And I was the, her lifeline between every levels she gone into deeper of the schizophrenic, schizophrenia. And then she hanged her son. And at that time, I really uh, was so afraid of my own power because I before have felt that my spirit helped people to be joyful, not to be uh, happy. And then I could see that okay, my energy can be used for the opposite. They can be used for, and uh, I felt that I was dangerous. So at the time, I really didn't ask for anything for myself, just to helping someone in the world. And I couldn't help people because I could destroy them. I met a man that I couldn't destroy because he was so down under. And I live without a home, living on drugs, have three kids, in their relations from before. Uh, he came from another country, Argentina, and uh, I, I just felt that this man I can help. And we came to be uh, together and we moved to Buenos Aires for a year. I worked with the shoes there with my clothes because I, I, I had a big exhibition in Stockholm before and took it with me. And because art has always been my survival tool. And I got pregnant and I came home when I was in seven months. Yeah. He was always abusing. And yeah, I was really physical and psychical damaged. So by that time, when my daughter was two and a half, I had such a double life because I had my, in the tennis, uh, 
place. I had a really good fortune to be a head coach. And I had a exhibition going around in the biggest art halls. And that made me feeling that I'm worth more and able to take my daughter that was two and a half and go away. And we lived for hidden address in 10 years. But during that time, I healed myself with sounds and crystals. Mm. So that was the start of the healing journey. And you become a tennis coach at 14? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to tie the thread to the story. So when you met this guy from Buenos Aires, Buenos yeah. Aires, he was abusive to you. Yeah, yeah. You had, so you, he you was a, in his nature. Yeah. You had a child with him. And then obviously you had to escape from that. You escaped from that difficult situation. Yeah. Without Thanks. nothing, I had to shift my name, all what I owned, put aside. And uh, all what I have uh, come to as a head coach and uh, all my art, because I had to change name and hide myself from being seen in society. So I really quit it all so and start anew. Do you obviously face a whole decade of living with minimal resources and a hidden address? Yeah. You maintain this unwavering belief that everything would work out. What was that made you feel that way? What was that unwavering belief? I lived with very deep connection with my higher self and I've mm. always done. And it's every step is a little bit more light than the yesterday. I didn't see that, oh, I don't have that and that they have that and that. nothing like that. It's more, I see the light uh, in the tunnel and I love the light. So it's like nobody saw that I was suffering so much because I also had a good life in the same time. Mm. How, how, how strange it sounds, but really I feel the presence of the beauty everywhere. Mm. Mm. Then your life seemed to have taken an unexpected turn because you start to delve into the corporate world working with city planners and officials mm. and politicians. And it seems that your mission was to make different fields collaborate, bring inspiration yeah. and vision. How did your experiences in the corporate world shape your perspective on societal structures and the collaboration of diverse fields of knowledge. You know, why I came to the healing art afterwards and writing my books that is really going beyond the academy and the corporate field, why I came there is because I didn't success as I wanted. I built this place. This is my studio now, but it was a conference place that I built to show how a conference place could be to be interactive and creative because everywhere where I came to places to have conferences, there were stuck tables, there were some, it, 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 it was not made for people to really be vulnerable, to be uh, happy with each other, just to, to be uh, like in the central energy, to catch the other's uh, abilities and combine them with them. But when the, they came here, things happened, but then they came back into the work and it was just like a fly that happened and then disappeared mm. again. Then I un understood more about the connection with the brain, heart and body that is so important for our mind to be embedded in the energy field of the heart, to be able to see anew. If the mind is uh, separated from the body, it can only see what it's already experienced and experience what they already knew. Yeah. So I had to go out of the comfort zone in the corporate field and go into, we don't have to meditate, but we need to go down in, into a place where our heart expands. Mm. And that was so interesting when I had the refugee camp. It's, it sounds so strange that I have been in all these words, but it's true. Anyway, when I was in refugee camp, no one of us had the same language. 
Yeah, 12 the, different nationalities there. Yeah, up to 14 different and oh, the, all the re religions and everything. We were 84 persons up to 135, depending on it. Oh, there came so many refugees to Sweden by that time. Nobody spoke the same language. Of course, they spoke Arabic, all of them. But everyone was in a place of not being able to hush the other down because they they had to survive themselves and their new surrounding to make it a bit uh, stable. And because we couldn't speak that much, we had to look in each other's eyes and listen with our heart what the person really wants to say so I can help them with that. Yeah. And that made another connection that I never would have if we spoke the same language. Being exposed to a diverse range of religions and cultures is a really unique experience because yeah. that obviously has become a, a source of profound learning and inspiration. Yeah. How did your time running the refugee camp influence your understanding of, let's say, entrepreneurship and religion and ultimately lead you towards writing books? Yeah. First of all, I feel that it's my greatest work in the corporate field. It's uh, running the camp because we were like a family and people maybe stayed there for three months, two months, four months, different uh, years sometimes. But when people left, you came and the people who were there, they came to carry their bags and help them into the infrastructure that we had. So it, it was like when it started right, it rolled on and everyone was carrying the culture of, of the camp. For, first of all, uh, I worked in the university and implementing entrepreneurship into university when we started the camp. So I already was working with that, with it. And first of all, I actually wrote a book about learn how to play tennis with entrepreneurship or learn entrepreneurship through tennis, because in the middle, everything appears so obvious. It's so easy to learn something when you have two things and see the middle point. So that started to grow. And then I had the refugee camp with all the religions. And in Sweden, we are really so not religious. And it's like taboo to be spiritual at all. Now, of course, we have more and more people becoming it. But as in the word. Is it taboo to be religious or to be spiritual? Or both? Yes, both. It's really taboo if, if I work in the corporate field and in the academy. It, it's very interesting anyway to be in the can where it was, everyone could say, they said, okay, I can accept any religion, but not having a religion, that is scary. It's really it's scary. So I spoke so much with them about my way of viewing our existence. And with that, I expand my viewing of the existence because I have someone to speak with, uh, speak about it in our poor English. There are people who understand more P English than the other. And uh, during that time, because I was writing about tennis and entrepreneurship, came beyond that as well. And then it was like all my history of being in different parts of society, it created visions beyond. And the most important for making it happen was a dance retreat that I was in. Five days of just dancing. It's called Five Ru Roots of uh, Gabriela Ross. And it made me addicted to start the morning one hour go up very early and dance one hour. And then I start to get messages. So it was my start channeling. And then everything that I had in my surrounding start to make this book, the first book, this creative existence unfolding a new conscious world. Mm. Yeah. And the quest for deeper understanding, because it seems you ventured more into the healing arts and sound yeah. healing and shamanic mm. studies. And from reading about your story, that marked a significant shift in your mission 
bringing together all of your diverse skills and experiences, can you share more about the transition into sound healing, guided yeah. meditations, and your experiences as a student of Energy Medicine Institute's energy healing and shamanic sage wisdom? Yeah. Wow, that's a big subject. First of all, as I said, when I was 30 and escaped with my daughter, I healed myself with crystals and sounds. And it's not a coincidence because I came into a stone shop and uh, I just loved them. And I bought two stones and one for my daughter. And after some blocks where we worked, my energy start to rush and like I had to vomit or really have a problem to walk straight. So I took my daughter on my shoulders and ran back. Then she put another stone on my solar plexus, a jade, and it was grounding. And it's because I was so sensitive by the time. So I was really receptive to it. And she had some records of planetary sounds from the space and then I was healing with it. So it was in my background, but of course, by the time I couldn't see it as a work or something, but I healed by it. So I came to trust the energies. I'm just a person that always go deeper and deeper into something that works. And that is the energy healing and the shamanic healing and everything. It, it's the most creative thing we can do. In my retreat, I work, the coming retreat that I will have starting February 3rd, it's about embodying du divine duality. It's to really combine two counterparts and heal ourselves from what we judge from within ourselves and outside. It's so powerful. And the first cycle will be about experience my own or everyone's own divinity mm -hmm. and it's 21 days and the one week of rest and then next cycle of 21 week will be healing from everything that is keeping us from live our divinity and then a rest for a week and then the third cycle where we come to uh, really to the core of being creating our lives Healing for me, in the beginning, everything was about creating, about art, about in the tennis court to, uh, to make people thrive and have fun and everything. And when I had my struggles in life, I came more and more into seeing that people couldn't thrive if they had all this uh, field of energy that doesn't support them to be themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the corporate world, I saw that the taboos and all was need to be, to be right in their different fields. It made people stuck. And then I understand that healing is the most creative thing we can do. It's really a healing act to, to clean our field, to become ourselves. And being ourselves, we are such in bliss. It's just so fantastic. <laughs> so... So that's, uh, I don't know if it's an answer of the question, but energy is everything. And we can see that sound is the origin of energy with the sound, especially vocal sound that comes from our inner and everyone's voice is the best healing tool for themselves. And our sound is really going into the core of where everything is existing and can shift. So sound is such a clear energy and it's uh, rolls, all our system is uh, ruled by water, more or less. And the sound works through this uh, infrared field of water to make difference. And it's a magic tool for me in life. I think I, I don't survive on the, only eating right, drinking right. I love it also. But Magic is the, the best medicine for me to be alive. I couldn't uh, think about a life without magic. And even when I had terrible times, as it 
looked like and also what it felt like. I always had some magic spark guiding me. There's magic everywhere. We just don't. Exactly. It's not attuned to it. When you, mm. when you plant a seed in the ground. Yeah. There's magic when it grows. But we have nothing yeah. to do with that. Yes. Right? Exactly. Right? Yes. Yes, we can tend to it once we see the green shoots. But really, once we put the seed in the ground and we make yeah. sure the environment, the soil, yeah. you know, like you were talking about the corporate side of things, that's not the right environment. Because no. that's of judgment and duality. And, mm, and we're born of... with it from our yeah. family and everywhere. So because we have lived so long, so many thousands of years in inverted duality, for me, I feel that if we just use the simple tools of the other side of the coin. For me, the duality has been misinterpreted, but it must have been because it's from one oneness, it came two and two separate things. But the, if we see it as a split, it's like split from source and we need a God that helps us instead of that we are source, everyone. And the, the grass is source, and the, the trees and the, the animals, everyone are oneness and God. But people are talking about wanting to go back to oneness and to duality is a bad thing. But that's just an illusion because duality exists. We know that we have everything is the void of yin and yang that exists. And the creative field is. When we don't see it as a split, but as oneness, the conscious, one consciousness wanted to expand, to be interplaying itself through its creation. We live in duality. We live in a physical universe, but also there is the universal creational part. There are different dimensions and we're yeah. in the 3D, 3D dimension. We can't necessarily escape. Time has slowed down. Here, time is much slower. And mm. I think I told you, when I had an NDE experience last year in January, yeah. Yeah. There, there was no time. No. And it was like I felt oh. things telepathically. But yeah. Yeah. In this physical realm, in this duality, time is slowed way down. So that mm. I can start to feel things and learn things and yes. take that time to mm. be able to experience what it's like to live in that duality. Um, one, uh, one of the uh, things I want to ask you is I feel there's a real human desire for peace amidst the challenges mm. of duality. And there's a struggle to navigate the dichotomy of good or bad. And there's this longing for oneness to become mm. much more apparent. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the journey of longing for peace within yeah. the context of duality and how the desire for oneness may lead individuals to unintentionally fall into judgmental patterns? Oh, yes. I will try. First of all, we live in a physical world in 3D, but our mind and our emotion lives in the 4D and our higher self lives even higher up. So we are, we are not only living in 3D. We just need to understand how to materialize the wisdom that we have outside this physical field. And if we see our consciousness, we have been taught that our consciousness is our mind, is our brain. But uh, if we see it as our highest self has just one consciousness, but when we come into 3D and mat get materialized, the consciousness from higher self divided into three, into mind, heart, and the body that is just matter from earth and genetics. Just for me, the vertical breath is, is the most magic tool. First of all, to breathe vertical between our consciousness in our mind and our heart and expand our heart, having 
the consciousness centered in our heart and expand the heart and the body starts to vibrate. And then we know that we feel that we embedded in our own energy field. And from there, we see exactly what our higher self sees beyond the 3D. And then it's our creativity to make it, to apply it in the 3D world. So actually, when we breathe vertical, we get into inner peace and power, inner power. And we're in there. We, we stop worrying. We start to connect. And with a connection, we change the world. So that is a start. But it, and it's also a start to make us creative and have the joy that we have meant to have. We are source wanting to make the interplay between yin and yang between black and, and light. And the start is to not judge something as better than the other from light and darkness, because darkness is the source, is a void that created consciousness, the light. Everything started from blackness. And why consciousness was able to be born from the void, in my way of seeing it, it's because the field, the void, contains one substance that keeps it all together, and that is love. And it is the mother that we have really uh, teared to be not as good as the father energy. But the mother energy actually is the black soil that keeps the seed growing. It is our womb that keeps an embryo growing. It's our universe holding the planetary and solar system in balance and emotion. It's all holding a system that is such thick energy. And that's what we feel when we do Qigong, understand our energy field and expand it. We can feel the gratitude of being in this darkness. And then our conscious mind, that is the light, can penetrate whatever and create the word. That's really what I see as part of the alchemical process. Yeah. Because we go from the grado, the blackening, builds yeah. that initial stage of personal transformation where we confront our shadow self, we look at the aspects of ourselves that may not be fully aware of, or we might be reluctant to acknowledge. So that phase really involves facing personal challenges, undergoing a, a process of self-reflection and acknowledging areas of inner darkness or unresolved issues. And that can be a real period of um, discomfort and certainty before we move into albedo or citronatus or rubido. Yes. Every time in my shamanic energy, when I practice it and teach with it, it's always to take our emotions of something that is really make us suffer, take it to surface to make it seen. And when it's seen, we can go into it and both heal ourselves and get the self-knowledge that is so necessary to take the steps that is right for me and not follow any other's footsteps, but really those that we call soul lessons or challenges that comes up, it's really a foot for us to witness and to be with, and then to come through to the other side. And there we will uh, have less burden that we didn't even know that we had, but we just feel the freedom in our field. But we need to, to face it because to face it, it's to go to next level of our, ourself. We can't do it without suffer. And then the more we do it, the more we understand that su uh, this path is something that is good for us and the suffer turns less and less because our bliss gets more and more vibrant when we uh, go through healing after healing, layers by layers. And the, the consciousness about all existence and how I don't need a God up there 
but I, I can just take in the energy field of that existence and amplify myself with it. And then I am. When I take in a, an energy, an external energy that I feel it's, it's external, but I like it, and I give myself the gift to take it in, I start to vibrate it, and then I am. So it's nothing external. It's just that in our 3D world, look at this as external, and we can always interact with what we want to interact with. So we have to be very careful what we take in, what we take into our system. And that's the one thing we can control. We can control our breath. And our breath mm. is a, a super highway, like the left and right brain, into many different dimensions as well mm. of being. Yeah, yeah, because we are all, we are all coming from a source. And when we just connect to whatever, it's a part of us. It's a part of us because we are only one thing, one, one energy, one consciousness divided into different spectras of the same light. And when I walk my own path, that is my individual fractal. Then I'm connected to all. When I step away from myself, I leave the connection to all. And that's an important point because I was looking at how do we start to rethink duality for a thriving earth? Because beyond that, the physical form of duality in the 3D world, there's this other side and everybody talks about it. People experience it as I have this potential for oneness to thrive. So. The idea challenges the notion of duality as a split. And but it's not a, a split. No, I know. know. It, but, but it, it, that, it's an expansion. Exactly. That's what I think. Yeah. yeah. It invites that view where one that's ex is an expansion. Yeah. Which could then yeah. offer a new chapter for this great mother we call Earth. My question for you is, in your expertise, how can we shift our perspective on duality from being a split to a concept that includes oneness that fosters a field of love and creativity for earth and humanity. Yeah, we have to start with ourselves and that is the most smooth way also. Mm. And as Tesla is talking about number three, six, three, six, nine, it's actually the, what divine duality is talking about because it's, if you feel that oneness is there in the top, and the two counterparts of duality are there. In the middle, it exists the child that comes from the two counterparts. As a parent, is not two parents doesn't get a child that is exactly a copy of those two genetic lines, but have spirit. Hmm. Everything that we put from those two counterparts and into the center. It's get this spiritual energy and always the healing comes in. So if as a person, what is very easy for one to feel is if first we, we can just take the yin yang, the mother, when we start to learn about the mother and the father or the feminine and the masculine and start to make them come together, we can feel the ecstasy of yin and yang that is like the sun, the ray of the sun that great ex exploding exactly the same ecstasy is between darkness and light. It's not like a smooth round, it's really ecstasy. And when we start to understand this field and we can put in one side something that we judge ourselves for, something that we think I'm not good enough. And on the other side, put forgiveness. And slow the, the more slow we do it, the more valuable energy comes in the path. And when we put them together, we are free. And we feel the energy of dissolving of this judgment. And in this triangle, where, where it is, in the triangle, it's an area where we can go in and start to create a new from this new energy. Mm. It's a filled area of this divine energy that is from oneness and duality in combination. The whole concept of divine duality, because yeah. it, it seems that 
you portray it not as a linear step-by-step process, but as a combination. Yeah. Emerging Mm. between healing, conscious creation, and the willingness to step into the unknown. (laughs) Yeah. So so it suggests to me that the path to divine duality is really open to each and every one of us, but it emphasizes the importance of surrender and inner power as well. Mm. What role does healing, conscious creation, and willingness to embrace the unknown play in this transformative journey? If we start with accepting to try to breathe between our intelligences, our perceptions start to be open, open to existence, because we come into a state of a power that we can't feel if we're not there. And peace feeling of that we are sustained in our living and can hold ourselves in this energy. It's in another worldview. They have already come into a field where they have no really judgments, but they see that they suffer from putting themselves back or holding themselves back, uh, creating quarrels that they don't want to do and then have to go back and say, I'm sorry, (laughs) you know, everything. And they know that they want to heal it. So it starts with a pleasant feeling that we are loving ourselves. And then the healing can start. It it must be some kind of sense acceptance where we can feel our own feel. And it makes everyone I work with to surrender. And on the other side of that is freedom. Yeah, it's freedom and it's magic. It comes from me as a practitioner. Mm. I have had so many people that I have in the Akashic Record as I helped with their soul, to realign with their soul. I have seen hundreds of people and their pattern and I understand their reaction. And their behavior is so much. So I cannot blame anyone anytime. I see people and I start to understand the realities that people are carrying around with. And all what I was before hush with, I can't be any longer because I've seen so many people beyond what they are carrying in their energy fields from different lifetimes, from genetics, from different things that they have been with. And There are nobody to judge for anything. That's well said. Something I've been really intrigued by is multidimensionality, which I think is also part of divine duality. Yeah, yeah. Because it's clear to me there is a current movement towards a paradigm shift on this planet. Yes. By heightened frequency. Yes. It encompasses multidimensionality or divine yeah. duality. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, and this, but as this is happening, what I'm also seeing is that the heightened frequency is bringing shadows to the surface. Right. Which is, which is leading to visible changes in the world and the dissolution of old establishments. Yes. And my question to you is, how does Earth's heightened frequency contribute to the surfacing of shadows and what impact does it have on the changes observed globally including the dismantling of old establishments yeah first our earth is going to a new cycle to be in a higher consciousness so it's nothing that we can do anything about It's just a cycle of earth that has been in sleeping mode and now I'm going to more and more awakened mode. Yeah, it's just a cycle of 26,000 years and now we are at the, we have passed 13,000 years and come to the next phase that is the new paradigm. But also because of this, people who have been open, they have been entrepreneurs making internet (laughs) <laughs> making all these energies coming more and more abstract. And so everything that first, the energy field of earth and the contribution with all the inventions from people have accelerated all the expansion of the multidimensionally on earth. 
So it's not like we live in 3D any longer. Everyone push a button and the computer comes up and we speak to each other, even though we are not telepathic. But actually we are also in this time, we are shifting our understanding of the word so much that we also start to be more telepathic. And people are gaining more and more abilities beyond the the physical to be in the physical. So we are interacting with this. And exactly as the energy medicine, we have to take up uh, the emotions that are stuck in place to come through it. It's what Earth is going through now with the people and the wars. I wrote about it in this book that we talked about in the start, this creative existence unfolding in your conscious world. Yeah, 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 that went. I wrote it beautiful between book. 2012 and 2015. It's a beautiful book. Mm, thank you. So uh, it, anyway, uh, we are at, at the very spot when we don't interact with the fear, it stopped being real. Everything needs two pools to exist. It needs a positive and negative pool in this duality. And if we don't react, if we don't play the game of this, this war energy and then not being in fear, it drops to exist. We drop the us versus them. Yeah. I have some true examples of it from my, from my own life. Go ahead. But, let's hear them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to share it, let's hear it. Like, there are many of them. But one was when I was about, maybe I was uh, 25 or something. And uh, a good friend of mine, she lived in a place that was on construction. So it, it was in the bottom of this place. It was... Uh, industrial place that was turning to be a luxury place. But before that, it was very rough. And in the bottom ground of this building, there were a black club, a club that was dealing with drugs and there was really a harsh one. And we had a party in her upper place and we had a good fun. And then we wanted to go out because the bakery, we know that we can open a his window and we can buy from his, from his bread before it was open. So it was maybe two o'clock and then I, I, from this place downstairs, there were a man, uh, like a guardian of this place and they hold a, a bottle of champagne in his hand and he asked, who is the owner of that party that it shouldn't exist because it was someone that uh, taking their place, you know? So they asked who was the owner and the owner was my friend and she was a bit back of me. And so I didn't want her to be, be suffer. So I said, it's me. <laughs> and he started with his bottle, start to hit. And he said so many bad words so many. And they just said, you're right. And he dropped the bottle. Oh. <laughs> so, because I didn't interact with him. And that's just one of, of all, I don't know why I play so dangerous games, but I don't play them. I just come into them. Into you. Or, or came, because I never experience them now. It was like teaching me the existence of the energy all the, the way in my life. I want to just delve into an aspect of divine duality, especially for listeners, because my feeling is it doesn't require specific traits or psychic abilities. No, it's Instead, very simple. It, it calls for a willingness to awaken new capacities mm. through an activated heart and body and mind. The importance of letting go of preconceived notions of right and wrong is really mm. important. So can you elaborate on how the path to divine duality is accessible to individuals regardless of specific traits and what role an activated heart and body can play in this transformative journey. Yeah. First of all, I see that it's really heals the other side of duality so fast. It's so instant that people change their lives. 
But what I can say, it's when I lived with hidden address and everything, and you ask how I could be there. It's always just search the light. If a person search the light, they will be able to go into it. Because darkness is, is really a loving thing. But when we search the darkness, it's opposite. Come, come inverted. So when we want to hate, when we get feeded by hate, and we get happy for someone hurt, then we can't come there. And we will not even be able to see the light when we transition into next life either. That is another parallel I can tell you about. So, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> I have my husband. His mother, it was 2003, she died and uh, she was so afraid of dying. And when we were uh, at the funeral, the mm. priest came in front to start to speak when the clock has been ringing. And then he was sat in, in, in a, at the side and I didn't know what happens now. And I just say, okay, I'm here with Volber, it was her, her name. So I just sat there and I felt the darkness was like a dazzling field of darkness that was so uh, vivid. And I, so I just sat with that and he was sitting with it, didn't think about anything. And with sitting in it, with it, the darkness started to get calm, started to get just a thick darkness. And I sat with it. I didn't think about anything. And then it was a little spot of little less dark, like a nail. And I got curious and I got into that little a needle knot and I saw that it was light. And I thought, okay, if I go there, will the light get wider? But it didn't. It got like a thin, or thin light. And I just followed that thin li line and then suddenly little, and it, there was so much light and she was lying in the middle of the room. And she was so nervous about death, so she couldn't see the spot. And if we are faded by darkness, we can't see that spot. That is the transition, actually. And we have to go into the darkness to light it up. Yeah. Yeah. And one, of, one of the things that I found in my life is that it's not so much about learning. It's about unlearning and then relearning. And aligning to that process of what I'm relearning, because I feel that can contribute more yeah. towards the development of this creative healing field. What role does each individual's unique inner divine nature play in this process? How does the unlearning and relearning process contribute to that development? We can do this unlearning and relearning. For me, it's too hard way because I feel that when we really align with the present moment, with the, with the breath and the present moment, there are no reality. There are only the breath and uh, there are nothing to relearn or a restructure because if we just start to live more and more in the now moment and experience the energy that is then we can interact with everything in synchronicity in the world. And we didn't even know or think about that we were different the, the second before. We are just now in the reality that the here and now in the existence is. And if we live in that present energy, everything around us starts to be more harmonious. And the things around us makes the evolution with us. Years and years ago, years and years, about 30 years ago, back in my youth, I was uh -huh. training in Olympic weightlifting. And what I recognized later on in life is that was quite linear. Mm. And, and then I went to do martial arts. I went to do Aikido, which was not a linear production at all. Mm, and yeah. I needed to shift my mindset in transitioning from a linear production to flexible interaction, what shifts in mindset and behavior are necessary and how does this new world demand a different use of our platforms? 
Ah, uh, yeah. First of all, I think we are thrown out from having any idea of tomorrow. <laughs> so people are just thrown out like the baby in the water to learn to swim again. Yes. <laughs> we can't have a five-year plan because we don't know about tomorrow. The only thing we can do is to start to breathe, to understand ourselves. And within that, survive in this flexibility that is the word. So I think actually that everyone is forced to be more flexible by life itself. We can't take an education and know that we will have a job until we have got 65. We don't know anything for sure. And this flexibility is because we didn't take it by ourselves, we are thrown into the bus to take it. And the more problems we come into, the, the more we will feel the differences of realities in our body, in our heart and our mind. And actually when our heart and mind and body start to have the same idea of the world, then we have a correlating system that is connected to all. So what really happens when we suffer a lot, it's because we have different realities in ourselves. Our mind has a reality of how we should do. Our heart has a willing to something else and our body suffer from the disconnection of the mind. It doesn't listen to the communication from the body. It's the communication between mind and body is 90% from the body. And if the mind doesn't listen, we start to have injuries. We start to have suffer. And if the heart longing for something and we do something else, the suffer is so bad. So we start to, as you say, okay, I just surrender. <laughs> Can't do anything else. <laughs> you have this vision of divine duality in your programs as a path to finding pure potential yeah. and understanding oneself from a point of success and evolving oh. into a sacred space. Yeah. And when I was looking at that, it, it emphasizes the experience of a life when where doing less achieves more, yeah, exactly. serving humanity by being oneself. Yeah. Having flow in daily life. How does your program's vision align with your vision for personal and professional growth? And what specific elements resonate with your aspirations for a fulfilling life? Everyone has their own mission with coming to earth. There are no clue of that everything is the same for different people. We have to find it ourselves and we will do it in starting to match and merge our di diversity inside ourselves. And the program is, is this one that is coming now in February. It's starting with first understand who am I, my divinity, my higher self and my soul lessons and everything to understand who am I. And then the next cycle is to say, okay, I really feel that this stands in the way for me to living the divine self. And then it's to rebirth the creativity that everyone has in themselves to create this energy, how to land it in 3D. If we are correlated in our energy system, we are correlated with all what happens around us. And then things that we couldn't actually create it appears. Things unfold. And it's unfold with our vibration, with our beingness. And it's not like it's, I'm sitting here and just being and things comes. Because my beingness is taking the trajectories and can do it in such a slow motion and do it so in their own time. And things happen because time and space is just our mind, uh, what we have... <laughs> It's a human construct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a mind construct. Yeah. I think all of us have, have felt that it's so different how time is going faster or slow. Mm. So it's not a reality, it's a construct. So 
when I breathe and I keep my intention that is powerful from the mind and hold the energy of this frequency of this intention in my body, I know what to do and it will be in synchronicity and things will unfold the most marvelous ways. It's reality, actually. And everyone will create their own way of doing it with, with divine reality. No one will be a copy of the other. That's good. You don't want nodding robots. <laughs> no. I want to delve into the practicalities, your practical approach to the program, because well, you describe the focus on charging voice, body, and creativity. So yeah. the emphasis on these modalities are for self-healing and healing others with one's own voice, with introspection and reflection, and the exploration of a red thread within real steps each week. How do you perceive the practical aspects of the program, especially the emphasis on charging voice, body, and creativity? Yeah. First, we will step-by-step step learn more and more about how to use our voice and to use undertones and to use how to make the breath go through all the body and using vocals because vocals, the the consonant in the alphabet is masculine energy and it's penetrating energies in it. And the, the vocals, you call it vocals? Mm. The, the other, A, A, I, yeah. Oh, oh, the, the, oh the, the vowels. The mean. vowels. Yeah, vowels. thank you. Yeah. The vowels are the healing ones right. and the receiving ones. So when we start to use vowels with our vocal sound, we start to heal the different parts in our bodies. It's both feminine and masculine, and then we are integrating them. So with sound, we are integrating things. It sounds strange, but it's so simple. To integrate it, every week we have a morning and a midday and an evening practice, a kind of meditation and a practice to make, it's so important to have rituals, to start to make rituals in our life and not only running like life is like that, but have some statements in the start and stop in the middle and start to view, reviewing life mm. and in the end to capture the the gratitude for what was uh, and and it will be different from week to week mm. these practices so we will have both practices where we meet and then we gather and i have uh, one one sessions with everyone three of them and also two extras with vocal sound healing and with the healing in the Akashic Records. And the travel is such an intense thing and such a smooth path in the same way. But the rituals are so important not to be caught in the, the daily life of what was seen before, mm. but to reestablish the, the divine self. The other thing I wanted to touch on is the three important shifts in the program because it outlines three important shifts, changing worldviews, purifying shadows, and achieving synchronicity in the cooperation between mind, heart, and body. And it acknowledges the rooted automatic programming within individuals, but emphasizes a deliberate discipline and full willingness for the transformative journey. In your perspective, how do the three outline shifts contribute to the process of embodying divine duality? And how do you envision navigating, embracing these shifts during the program? Yeah. So the dedication comes from our energy fields start to vibrate in a new energy and these realities start to be our own. We start to own the reality that we didn't own before. Before we were separated and have to survive and have to thrive to, to do the right things and have to, to be as everyone else wanted. And we had that. But as fast as our energy fields start to vibrate in another energy, that reality start to diminish. The determination is more in the start. And what I've seen from my clients, they start to be more and more in wonder of life. 
And then it's a dedication is not something that you have a discipline to. It's just in the start. It's a revelation of your, of joy. <laughs> and as we wrap up, I want to ask okay. you, first of all, do you have any passing words and where can people find you? Hey, my passing words can be, as I've written in my building, never following the master, the footsteps of the master, follow what they sought, look for what made them come becoming masters. <laughs> And of course, two more things. The most important for the shift in the world is self-love. And everyone's voice is a healing voice for them. No one's voice is a not good voice. Everyone's voice is wonderful and perfect. And uh, you can find me on oakroodspiritualacademy.com and everyone have a free discovery session. Just sign in for a free discovery session in one hour and we go deeper into your decisions and desires. Mm. Mm. That's Oak Root Academy, is it? O A K Root. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Academy, one word. Okay. And I want to thank you for generously sharing your profound journey of your life from the early roots of your artistic identity to the transformative path of divine duality. And I want to honor your resilience and wisdom and commitment to personal and collective growth. It's been an honor to explore the depths of your experiences and insights. So I want to extend my sincere gratitude for you being a guest on the Transcendent Minds podcast, because the other thing, you're welcome. The the, the other thing is that your unique perspective on spirituality, natural laws, and the unfolding of divine duality has undoubtedly left an indelible mark on our conversation. I think that your journey is a testament to the power of self-discovery and the transformative potential that really lies in each one of us. And I also want to thank you so much. Peter, thank you. For this. I keep raving about it, but it's just such a beautiful book and full of wisdom. Thank you. I so, can tell um, you also why you uh, why we read it like this. It's exactly, my, like this. It, it's my guides telling me that people will not get into the conscious of the book if the body doesn't read first. They just showed me the, my visions of people just moving the page and the energy of the page comes first and then the mind. Oh, I see. And what's been your experience today? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> That's it. Mm-hmm. That's good enough. <laughs> yeah. Have you had a good time? Have a good time. Thank you, Peter. Michael. You're welcome. <laughs>